Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey! And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, it's our Listener's Choice event. Winner Michael Cook picked John Sturgis's 1963 film The Great Escape for us this week. Before we get into that, though, you should learn more about the show at thenextreel.com. Subscribe in your favorite podcast app or join us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you've ever gotten real, real close to a Tom, Dick, or Harry... 
then you're just the mole for the next Reels Instagram hashtag pony prize hashtag guess the movie challenge. And with that, let's join Games Master Stephen Smart currently in the tunnel to find out who won this week. Hey guys, this week's movie was Point Blank from 1967, directed by John Borman and starring Lee Marvin. And this week's winner was At The Other Scotty. So congrats, you are entered once again into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday. So thanks, guys, and see you later. We got a little feedback from the good Ben Lott with the blot spot this time on our final Lang film. Yes, Ben says uh, about uh, Ministry of Fear. He says, of the Lang films we've done in the series, Ministry of Fear is the one where I most noticed the plot issues that you guys described. I also didn't love Ray Land in the lead role. But the plot still had a lot of enjoyable twists and turns. Even the lesser Lang films have been better than a lot of other directors' best films. Your rank 150, my rank 133. I think this was the one where we were probably closest in ranking uh, together. Um, it's, uh, I, I think we have the, the problems with it. Um, but yeah, it still is a fun film to watch. And like he says, even Lang's uh, lesser films are still awfully enjoyable. Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. <laughs> So my trailer, Pete, is for this movie called Kicks. Have you heard of this movie? I have, and I feel like I'm going crazy. I swear I know this story, <laughs> and I have seen this trailer, but it says that the trailer only came out uh, just today. How is that possible? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe you from the future came and whispered it in your dreams to you. I'm losing my mind. I'm going to have to Sherlock Holmes this a little bit. But this is the movie Kicks. It opened, uh, it premiered April at the Tribeca Film Festival and then played uh, just uh, yesterday at the LA Film Festival. And now it has a September 9th release. Um, This is a, it looks like a really interesting indie film about a boy, Brandon, who's 15 years old. His dream is to get a pair of fresh air Jordans. And soon after he gets his hands on them, they're stolen by a local hood, causing Brandon and his two friends to go on a dangerous mission through Oakland to retrieve them. The kid in this playing Brandon, uh, Joaquin Guillory, just looks fantastic in this trailer. I'm really curious to see what he's going to bring to the table and where he's going to go, because I think just from watching this trailer, this boy already looks like he's going to make a career from, for himself. Um, Justin Tipping directed this, written by Justin and Joshua uh, Bernay-Golden. I don't know of Justin Tipping, um, although he's done... Uh, mostly just some other uh, shorts. So this looks kind of like the thing for him. So I'm curious to see uh, what he brings to the table here. But it's got a great look. It's got a really interesting story. The trailer makes it look a little, uh, a little more dramatic and uh, kind of like that thriller sort of street, uh, you know, get these shoes back at any cost sort of vibe. Although it did say in the trailer, uh, you know, a great dramedy. So I'm like, okay, so is it a, it's a drama comedy about this kid trying to get his shoes back. I'm curious to see uh, where the movie's going to go. Uh, he's got some interesting bits about, you know, you know, wanting to be in space. And then you see this astronaut walking around and everything looks like a very interesting vibe. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm kind of excited to see this one. What did you think? Oh, I'm really excited about it. I think it looks terrific. The visual style is great. The the um, uh, addition of the astronaut is really clever, visually clever, and it seems to go in and out of having this this awesome city of God feel to it. That we're getting a sense of this of of what Oakland is like for these youth. That you know, unless you live in Oakland, you don't in this part of Oakland and specifically this. This piece of space and time, uh, you you don't have the the gift of being able to really understand it, and I think that's that's one of the things that it really feels like they're on a mission to uncover. It looks really great, really scary, really intense, and uh, I'm all for it. And Mahershala Ali is in it. He's the only face that I actually recognized in the whole trailer. We had talked about him way back when we did the Curious Case of Benjamin Button, uh, but he's also been in the Hunger Games films, Place mm-hmm. Beyond the Pines, um, and he's going to be Cornell Stokes or Cottonmouth in the Luke Cage. TV series, so awesome. So that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, so we we like him, and uh, yeah, I like I said, this movie opens September 9th and uh, this is definitely one I want to check out. So uh, you can yeah. come down and join me at it. <laughs> there you go. I'm gonna get in line with you. <laughs> my uh, my movie is not um, well. You know, I mean, I, I feel like I went 
with something kind of uh, serious and scary last week. And so this week I decided to do something not so serious and scary. So uh-huh. I'm doing The Space Between Us. Space Between Us is directed by Peter Chelsom, Alan Loeb, and Stuart Schill. Stars Britt Robertson, Carla Gugino, Asa Butterfield, and Gary Oldman. Uh, oh, and B.D. Wong, who is so great as Hugo Strange in uh, um, Gotham. Man, that guy is fantastic. Yeah, Anyhow, uh, so this is the f- story of uh, uh, Gary Oldman, who sends this group of astronauts to Mars uh, with the intent not to explore it and come home, but to live there, to be to start civilization on Mars. And so point one, the reason I initially became interested in this trailer is because I love that concept so much that we remove the, hey, we're going to bring you home safely part from the project plan, and this becomes a really interesting story to me. So uh, that's part one. Part two, turns out one of the women on the um, on the mission is pregnant and delivers the first baby on Mars. Uh, this baby grows up to be Asa Butterfield. Unfortunately, his heart is not strong enough to uh, withstand return to Earth, uh, so they thought. But guess what, Andy? He comes home. That's what we learned in the trailer. He comes back. He falls in love with Britt Robertson, and uh, uh, they uh, have a uh, essentially a John Green story. That's that's the story of him trying to to stay healthy as he's starting to fall apart as gravity do, does its work on him. So, I that part I don't know how I feel about it. It's cute. It's a YA coming of age story. It is literally a coming of age story, but it also is set around a premise of really cool science story that I'm fascinated by, and I'm excited to see it put on screen. What did you think? You know, I, I agree. It, it looks really intriguing. I, I wasn't quite sure where the trailer was going initially um, because uh, it, it just feels like a long setup in the trailer, but I guess they kind of had to just to give us a sense of what was going on here. But it had a nice feel. I, I, I liked the overall vibe. It looks kind of like that something for maybe not the kids, but for the youth, certainly. Um, there's a love story. There's sci-fi. I think there's a lot of elements uh, that could be coming together in this to make it something that's definitely worth checking out. Well, mine comes out August 19th in the United States. Uh, it starts open. Uh, it starts its run in Greece on August 18th through October 13th in Germany. Uh, so uh, August, September, October, pretty much a good fall, long fall global rollout. Awesome. Andy, uh, so this is the listener's choice. Yes, it is. Uh, we're very excited about this. This is uh, listener's choice, and we start our listener's choice, if you haven't uh, haven't turned in, tuned in to a listener's choice, um, with a, a brief interview with the winner of the listener's choice drawing, and we're, uh, with that, uh, very excited to welcome our guest. Who is our guest today, Andy? Let's welcome Michael Cook to the show to uh, introduce uh, The Great Escape and why he picked it as the Listener's Choice episode. Oh, Michael, I'm very excited about this movie. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for having me. It's a, it's a great honor. This is a real treat. I And and it was actually quite a surprise. Uh, I This is a movie I haven't thought about in many years, and I am much ashamed uh, at the fact I haven't seen it in years. Andy, when's the last time you saw this movie? I feel like it's been sometime in the last five years or so. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of the classics. This is a, a rock solid film. Uh, just great direction, performances, uh, great music. I mean, it's just kind of great all around. So, Michael, tell us why when when we you know we throw this out to to win the listener's choice. How did how did you land on the Great Escape? Oh, golly. Uh, well, I wanted to pick a film that I think a lot of people, uh, including myself, really enjoy. Uh, the reason why I picked The Great Escape mostly was uh, due to my grandfather. He introduced me to a lot of the classics when when, uh, when I was growing up. Uh, he uh, showed me a lot of uh, the Spaghetti Westerns, a lot of Humphrey Bogart, and uh, The Great Escape was uh, one of his favorite movies. Sounds like he uh, he's the sort of guy that we'd love to hang out with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he certainly was. Uh, when, so when would you say that you first saw this movie? How like at what age did he introduce this to you? I was probably running in and out of the room when I was about nine or ten when he was watching it. <laughs> right around Steve McQueen's uh, motorcycle escapades. Uh, oh yeah. When he uh, stopped me from running out of the room and uh, he shared with me, I think the one piece of trivia that everyone, you know, thinks that they know about this movie is that Steve McQueen did the majority of his own motorcycle stunts. 
pretty fantastic. Yeah, they're incredible. That that cemented, I think, Steve McQueen as my as one of my childhood uh, role models. I, it doesn't matter if I was swinging on a rope or swimming in a lake or riding a bike. I I was imagining I was Steve McQueen. I had to escape from something. Steve McQueen. <laughs> yeah, it, for for me when I when I was growing up, it was Harrison Ford with uh, Indiana Jones and uh, Han Solo. But uh, my grandfather really helped me. Uh, appreciate steve mcqueen a lot more there's nobody there's nobody in here that isn't uh that isn't just terrific though in terms of the, that sort of role model character i mean james garner i mean, come on richard attenborough richard attenborough yeah man from here he is he, he he's in escape and then he goes and runs the jurassic park i mean it's just one thing after <laughs> eventually plays santa claus yeah <laughs> he just a guy <laughs> Man. That's right. I forgot he did that. And Charles Bronson, too, who I just love. I mean, he's just, you know, kind of a uh 60s and 70s icon with some of his uh some of his big action films but you forget that he's uh one of the guys here and like in magnificent seven i mean he's you know he's just solid in all these films i mean it's a really a great cast james coburn donald pleasance i mean it, the list just goes on and on with wonderful names just great characters and it's a it's a great film with uh, so many just uh just uh, great performances. I mean, it's not really focused on just the one guy. It's it's one of those uh, ensemble pieces where you really kind of celebrate this whole group of these guys as they work to escape from this uh, this Nazi prison camp. Yeah, it does kind of like a Ocean's Eleven kind of feel before Ocean's Eleven even showed up. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I completely I, I completely missed that connection, Andy. We've been talking about Fritz Lang and all of the the rise of the Nazi power, and here we are. Now we're escaping. <laughs> right. This series, like could, could, Lang did. it could not be more perfect. So, do you have a favorite of all these guys in the film? You know, as a matter of fact, in anticipation for our phone call, I watched it again this week, and I, I think depending on what age you are, you have a, an attraction to certain characters. And this time around, I, I really enjoyed watching Donald Pleasance, especially when he initially showed up on the scene. He played a uh, Colin Blythe. He seemed um, less masculine, maybe more secure, but you know, however you want to uh, view it, but. You know, he was drinking his tea and he was bunking with uh, James Garner in the uh, the camp and his in their room. And James Garner's character says, "What what do you do here?" And he says, <laughs> "Oh, I'm the forger." I found that very entertaining. That's fantastic. Yeah, they all have kind of their little their little uh, nicknames, I guess. Right, the Tunnel King and the uh, Dispersal and Intelligence and the, the Mole Cooler King. Yeah, yeah. This was this is terrific. How does this film fit, uh, uh, Michael, for you into your overall uh, uh, movie viewing fandom? Is, would you say that this uh, represents kind of the movies that you that are your very favorites, or uh, is this kind of an outlier? How's that work? Oh, it's certainly not an outlier. It's I think my top ten kind of fluctuates. It's always in motion because it it's kind of depends on the mood that i'm in there are some days where casablanca holds a very high spot but then i just want to watch a you know just a grittier kind of movie and watch the the great escape or raiders of the lost ark the big fan of memento that came out you know many years after yeah. that so the big lebowski so i'm i'm kind of all over the place in the movies that i enjoy the great escape though i think will forever hold a uh, a close spot to my heart just because of the connection with my grandfather i think it says a lot um when people introduce a film to you that they think is special and they introduce it to you when you're at a, a young age or at least an impressionable age and it's something that you kind of connect to and um even if you may not kind of get it then it's something that you can kind of go back to later in life and kind of you know just still draw from as uh, as time progresses and always find new things in too uh, you know things that you connected to younger may may be different than the things you connect to as you get older like you said just finding uh, different uh, ca characters that you connect to as you get older uh, i as a matter of fact i showed my uh, oldest son who just turned 13 uh, this movie a couple months ago for the first oh, time. Oh, cool. And Did it hold up, really? I mean, I, you know, sometimes I'm, I find I'm really hit and miss on my, with my kids on some of these older films. Sometimes I am stunned at the movies that they will sit through with just rapt attention. And sometimes I'm stunned at the ones they want to go just pick their toes outside. Oh, that's a, that's such a good question because I feel like I try and, you know, teach, you know, I, I, I'm trying to instill some values and sh you know, show certain things to both my sons. And um, for instance, I, um, Caleb, my oldest, I tried to get him to watch uh, The Count of Monte Cristo recently, just to, you know, teach him a little bit about revenge and just how good of a story it was and whatnot. And it took him uh, three or four attempts to get through it. 
once it finished, he understood what the movie was about and he appreciated it more. Yeah, sometimes it does take a little time connecting and sometimes they, they enjoy watching it, but they don't get it so much. Like I was really surprised that both my kids sat and watched Metropolis with me. Um, but, right. uh, you know, I was like, well, I don't know how much of this they're really grasping, but I think there's a lot of visuals that at least they're kind of connecting to. Daddy, let me tell you the rise of the Soviet state. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think The Great Escape is one of those easier movies that, you know, you can pop into at any time and still catch a good scene, you know, that will probably suck you in for the rest of the movie. For instance, uh, when I was showing it to my uh, both my sons a couple of months ago, my wife walked in about halfway through and she sat down and enjoyed the rest of it, uh, which is unique because there's not a, there's not any strong female characters in the movie itself. You know, I do try and uh, share the good, the good, the oldies, but the goodies with my uh, children. Yeah. Well, and this is obviously another World War II film. And like you were saying, showing it to your sons, I mean, there's something about this that it's, I mean, I think it might be an easier uh, story to access kind of the, the just all of the stories going on with World War II and kind of the darkness and everything, because it really is kind of a prison break sort of film. And it might be right. an easier way to kind of, you know, get some younger people to kind of start getting a sense of, kind of what World War II was about without getting into some of the real atrocities until maybe they're a little older. Well, you're absolutely right. The, I, the one problem that I have with that is, and I, I think my, uh, both my sons are going to suffer with this for a little bit of time is, the movies are very Americanized. Unfortunately, you know, it, the, the real story, um, Americans, you know, helped a little bit with the creation of the tunnels and, you know, all the plans, but most of them were removed several months before the actual escape in showing, you know, in showing this movie to my sons, I wanted them to get a sense of, you know, the history and, you know, just from an action movie standpoint, it's a great movie, but I don't want them walking away with a lot of sense of now I know history. <laughs> right. If that's the case, I'd just show them Hogan's heroes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, better that than uh, the uh, monuments men. <laughs> okay. Now <laughs> you, yeah. I know you're bitter Andy, but try to contain yourself. <laughs> Well, this oh, is a man. this is a, a fantastic pick, uh, Michael. We sure appreciate it. Where are you? Uh, where are we talking to you from? Where? What part of the world are you in right now? I'm in New Hampshire. New Hampshire. What a beautiful place that is. Yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, I, I know you yeah. spent a lot of time making it, so. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I do what I can. We sure appreciate you taking the time to uh, to join us and talk to us and to uh, uh, to listen to the show and and care enough about movies to uh, to pick a great one. Yeah, we're really Thanks, excited I, to chat about this film. It's going to be uh, a fun one to revisit and talk about. I just want I just hope it uh, does very well in the flick chart at the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's uh, I think it stands a pretty good chance. Uh, do you do you flick chart do you flick chart along? Uh, no, I don't. It, 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 mostly because I, I I do watch so many movies and whatnot. And I think I would be a good candidate for it, but I I I, I honestly believe I would give myself a uh, aneurysm <laughs> just trying to just you know trying to choose one movie over the other. It it hurts yeah. every week. It hurts. It if no the Great doubt. Escape ever, yeah, if the Great Escape ever went up against Bull Durham, I would have a really hard time with that. <laughs> that's, right, <yeah. laughs> that's very telling. That is very telling. You and Andy are kindred spirits. There you go. <laughs> Such a great movie. Uh, well, thank you so much, Michael. We're going to let you get back to uh, get back to your thing, and we will get back right now to talking about this very film, The Great Escape. Thank you, Michael. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Sedgwick, manufacturer. Griff, as I said, Taylor. Right. Nimon Haynes, diversions. Which one's a forgery? Uh, the both are. It is the sworn duty of all officers to try to escape. There will be no escapes from this camp. Oh my God, they found Tom! Hold on to yourself, Bartlett. You're 20 feet short. The hole is right here in the open. The guard is between us and the lights. I love that he picked this movie for us, Andy. I, I really do. And I'm. It, it's a movie that is so wildly entertaining for me. Uh, that I am super conflicted by the people who have complaints about it. It, it like hurts my feelings <laughs> because those people are also, I think, right. I can't wait to talk about this. The film was directed, of course, by John Sturgis. It was written by James Clavell, W.R. Burnett, and Walter Newman, uh, as based on the book by Paul Brickhill. Uh, stars all the superstar man talent of the 60s, plus some Brits. 
<laughs> and and some fantastic Germans. Pretty much, that's it. It is it, it, it's Steve McQueen, James Garner, uh, uh, Charles Bronson, Donald Pleasance, James Coburn, uh, Richard Attenborough, uh, it, it, James Donald. Oh my goodness, it just goes on and on and on. It is a fantastic cast uh, for just this kind of movie. Uh, I found it's it's close to three hours, and I found it very difficult to take breaks. It's a, it's a great movie. I mean, I really enjoyed watching this. I'm definitely glad to have uh, gotten the chance to watch it again. You know, this is something that I honestly hadn't seen until uh, I think I watched it sometime for the first time in the, probably about the last five years or so. It was one of those uh, watches of shame that I did because one of my buddies was just so shocked that I had not seen this film before. And so he made me watch it. And so I watched it. And uh, yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. It's one of those just it's a really fantastic war film it's a it's a really strong uh tale of uh, you know just kind of like fighting on when when times are tough and uh it's just it there's an adventure sense to it there's you know just a the thriller sense to it um and there's the the fact that it's a true story it, it definitely is a dramatic story and it it also ends with some pretty heavy stuff as well um which is actually one of the things that made it a little uh difficult to get made initially because it's like well geez the story where you know 50 of the people get killed uh let's do something a little more cheery and uh but you know all that being said i i mean i really enjoy what John Sturgis does here, it is a very easy film to watch and just to instantly get engrossed in. Like once you put it on and start it, it's hard to uh, turn it off. Um, that being said, I think it's funny that um, my wife is one of those people who <laughs> she just like, I tried to get her to watch it with me and she's just like, oh, it's one of those those old war movies where just everything just seems so dramatic and she just couldn't get into it. Really? She acknowledges it's a thing, and so she's gonna try watching with me another day. We'll see. Oh, it's a thing. I think that's what I think that's what happens with some people. They, you know, especially if you're, you know, if you had a, uh, you were a kid, and your dad was always watching Mash or things yeah. like that. It's like, oh, one of those old war things again. Well, this is kind of in that same category with like Bridge Over the River Kwai and uh, Lawrence of Arabia and Ben Hur, and like it's just one of those movies. That's fantastic, and and your wife should also feel ashamed. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, 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 oh. no, no! You don't say that. Oh, come on. Uh, the film does tell the story of of the real life escape attempt uh, from Stalag Luft Three, uh, which was a prison camp run by uh, the Stalag, uh, not the Nazis. Uh, in uh, during World War II, and it was designed. This one was designed specifically for the uh, the prisoners who had had been uh, notorious for escaping from other places. They they you know obviously one of the core tenets if you are captured as a prisoner of war is to a try to escape, or b make life miserable for those who are containing you. And this is a film that that documents um, that that portends to document the stories of those people who are making life hell for their captors. The real challenge of this film, like any, if you don't know that it's based on a true story, none of any of this is going to matter, right? None of it matters because this is a movie about uh, a, a with an incredibly international cast that is that is balanced fairly heavily toward the Americans, but generally it is a global cast of wonderful actors telling a great adventure of escapism and it's it is wonderful it's fantastic um the the challenge that comes in when you look at what we do to it is uh you know we've talked about this a number of times on the show what are the, the lines that we cross uh as filmmakers to to make an entertaining movie for our audience uh and and you know what are the what are the compromises that you make to actually um, you know, get the film made in a way that is entertaining for the Hollywood vibe. And, and this one makes a lot of compromises, and it puts a lot of those uh, Americans in central roles when, if you are making it as a true story, uh, Americans were not a central role in, in the escape and weren't even in this camp, you know, up to seven months before the actual escape happened. And it absolutely diminished the, uh, the massive Canadian influence uh, on the escape, uh, and and so it's uh, you know it's it's challenging. Well, it's interesting because they they took 
a lot of Americans and put them in roles, not just American as American characters, but I mean, you've got Americans as Australians, Americans as, I don't remember if there were any Americans as Brits. I think it was mostly Americans. So uh, Charles Bronson was uh, was a Lithuanian immigrant who, uh, in Pennsylvania, an American playing a Polish uh, former minor. And, and interestingly, Bronson himself was a former minor. Right. And, and of, of course, the, uh, the three guys who actually escaped, who in the film, it's the Australian, a British guy, and the Polish guy. It's actually like, what, like two Norwegians. And uh, they, they shifted everything in weird ways. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, yes, it's great casting a bunch of Americans, I guess. But, you know, I don't know. I felt like it would have been... Uh, they could have equally, if they're casting all the Americans, why do they have to worry about making any of them American in the first place? Just you know, just make them what they are, or right? Something, you know? Right. Um, well, and and those those little things, like right, like why would you change the people who escaped? Why would you change their nationalities? Right? What does it matter uh, once they're they're all munged together in this camp? I mean, I guess they get away with it by just making these composite characters. Like, none of these characters are actually portraying a real specific person, like, by name. Right. Like, yes, you may have uh, X, um, who is uh, played by Richard Attenborough, playing Roger Bartlett. Um, he is playing the very specific um, guy who actually led this, Roger Bushel. But that being said, he's not named Roger Bushel in the film. He's named Bartlett. And that's kind of how they go through this. If there is somebody who is kind of like based on a very specific person, they don't call that out. So everybody is still kind of like these composites, amalgams of all these different things. So yeah, it's just, it's funny that they chose to go the, this route. But, you know, in in their defense... There were a lot of POWs in this camp, and there were a lot of people involved with this. And so they had to find ways to kind of blend some of this stuff together in the interest of kind of compressing the story to make it into something that, that still could be, you know, a nearly three-hour movie. Right. And and so, yeah, it, but it, this movie gets away with all this stuff because it is both compressing time. They do compress time, and they compress characters by, by creating composites. But what's fascinating about this is when you sit down to read the real story uh, of the actual escape that these... These guys pulled off it is just as good it's just different and it just makes me it, it's frustrating because this is one of those things where they made some choices where i don't think they needed to make those sorts of compromises to create a fantastic story and i finished this film uh thinking my goodness this is one that needs to be remade i would love to see this given a a, a new and and per, perhaps more authentic treatment well they did a little bit in the sequel to this um, which was uh, released um, in 1988 as a made-for-TV movie. It was called The Great Escape to the Untold Story with Christopher Reeve, Judd Hirsch, uh, Ian McShane, and interestingly, Donald Pleasance, who actually was playing a Gestapo officer in it. Um, they tried. It wasn't really a sequel. They were actually dramatizing the escape um, a little more realistically, using the real names of the people, um, and the first half was kind of about the escape, and the second half of the film was actually about the post-war investigation into the murder of the 50 escapees by the Gestapo and uh, and kind of the discovery of what happened and everything. So it's an interesting thing that they did. I don't know how the movie ended up being, although Judd Taylor, who's an actor in this, was one of the two directors who directed this. People have tried getting it out there and kind of telling the real story. I just don't know... I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who is going to greenlight a remake of The Great Escape. It's like doing a remake of Gone with the Wind. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know if well, it's exactly like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for that one. Uh, yeah, no, I I agree. I I, I agree in in on premise, uh, if if not completely in principle. I I really I you know I feel like this is such a powerful story, and it's one that that you know it it could actually be told right differently. Uh, and and given a little bit more modern treatment, and, and I think still be a great film. Yeah, I agree. Um, so uh, the film did go through six writers and 11 revisions, and according to Sturgis himself, he says, I'm not proposing this is a good way to make a picture, but it was the right way to make this one. Uh, ended up shooting scenes with no script, just uh, really winging it. 
Yeah, they really, uh, they really, uh, I don't know why they just struggled. But, you know, it was one of those things where these guys really had a hard time figuring out the right way to tell this. I mean, and, and Sturgis had been wanting to make this since the book came out. It just took him so long to find people who would fund the production of this thing uh, before the Mirish uh, company came on board. But um, I think in all that time, yeah, it's just it was all these different writers coming up with stuff. And people were like, well, which script are we using? And it, they got really confused during the production of this. And and sometimes they had no scenes. Like I think um, somebody was saying that the scene, the uh, 4th of July scene, when you've got the three guys doing their little uh, charade and, and giving everybody the booze, that was just kind of uh, put together on the day. So <laughs> it's just like, well, let's do something. You guys play, you do this little, uh, do this little show. But you know what? And how perfect was that sequence? I mean, it, it was perfect. It was perfectly paced. It ended up in the perfect place in the film, and it was perfect in the character arc of, of Steve McQueen's character, right? I mean, it was just, it, it was just brilliant uh, in every regard. Well, yeah, because that's also when the first tunnel gets discovered, and then you've got that, that just horrible moment when um, Ives breaks down. And yeah. and you have you know and he tries to escape and gets shot down and that you're right that the moment when that happens and and Hilt's all of a sudden kind of you know the trigger goes off in his head that he's going to actually now do what Big X wants and he's going to go out uh, escape get some information and then get caught so that he can give everybody that information uh, to help the the great escape. Well, and that is something we should probably back up for people who haven't seen it. Can you talk a little bit about the scope and scale of what these guys are, are ultimately trying to accomplish? Well, God forbid they haven't uh, seen it and are already listening to the show, but you know. I'm just saying. There in might interest be. of clarification, yeah. So, I mean, there's this uh, big escape that they're trying to do. It's called The Great Escape. <laughs> um, they're they're <laughs> Big X, when he shows up, I mean, like you said, they're trying to kind of keep these uh, these uh, guards busy and uh, some say to keep them um, so focused on all these people who are trying to escape that they're not paying attention elsewhere in the war like uh, you know like d-day and things like that but basically they come up with this plan to dig a tunnel and have 250 people escape in that tunnel and um, at one time and uh, so yeah it's it's a pretty pretty big plan. It's It would be the biggest um, prison bust on record if it ended up going according to plan, which of course it doesn't. And that that's sad. Yeah, it's yeah. rough. And it, it's really due to um, impatience, at least as it's portrayed in the film, uh, because one soldier just uh, just can't wait for the signal. <laughs> So we know a little bit of uh, of a couple of these writers. We've we have actually talked about uh, W. R. Burnett. Yeah, um, he uh, worked on the Asphalt Jungle, and we talked about Walter Newman, who worked on Ace in the Hole. Although he's actually not officially credited for uh, his work here or on Magnificent Seven, which he also did with John Sturgis, um, which is interesting that he came back to work on The Great Escape because apparently he had disagreements with John Sturgis in both cases mm -hmm. over changes made during the shooting, and so he wanted his. His name off. So I don't know why he came back to help again on The Great Escape after that happened on Magnificent Seven, but it, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And then, yeah, James Clavell also uh, worked on this, and, and uh, from looking at his filmography, The Fly is what caught my eye. This the film ultimately ends up being so artfully done, and I think they they kick off so well. The pacing in this film is done is is just so well metered, uh, mostly because of how it starts. Right? I mean, it starts so fast uh, into the uh, the life uh, of these guys and, and their place in the prison. I mean, what is it? The first uh, the first escape attempts, you know, they're they're planning the first escape attempts as the opening credits disappear, right? As the last credit rolls and they enter the camp, the guys are pairing off already, walking around the perimeter, start ta starting to talk about how we're going to get out. What are we going to make? What are we going to need? How are we going to get out? 13 minutes into the film, you already are seeing people <laughs> you know, trying to get out, yeah. hiding under the, the, the tree branches or or uh, whatever it is. They, they all have their plans, you know, disguising themselves as the, as the uh, Russian right. uh, POWs who are, are getting escorted off the property. And it's in this opening sequence that I start having a little bit of, of you know, um, I don't know, it's not misgivings about the film, but it's it, as they are found, they're discovered by the, the German soldiers in the camp. 
I have a hard time taking them seriously, and I'm sure that's because I grew up on Hogan's Heroes. I grew up on, you know, MASH. I grew up on these films that that sort of lampoon the war experience and share the same kind of color palette and, and general look of this film, uh, noting that this film, of course, came before. Um, it, it's still something that I have a hard time shaking because I want so desperately to laugh at these guys. I want to laugh at, at, the, at their shenanigans. This is, I mean, there are moments of levity paired with all of it. It's not like this is just a serious prison escape movie. Um, I mean, this really is kind of taking a, a spirit that is a little more, I don't want to say jovial, but it's definitely a little lighter at times. Like, uh, I think Sturgis really kind of finds a balance between the light, uh, lighthearted nature of some of these escape, att- escape attempts paired with some of the more serious moments when, you know, people are are having a breakdown and trying to get trying to escape and getting killed and all that sort of stuff. So I think he he does really find a balance between the the lightheartedness and the 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 darker moments. And I think a lot of that stems from uh, Elmer Bernstein's score. I mean, he's got such spirited music uh, for so much of it that you really feel kind of lighthearted because it kind of lifts you up, but then contrasts that with some of the darker darker um, pieces of score that emphasize some of the the uh, more rough moments. Well, and, you know, look at these characters that are, are meant to be comic relief. Angus Lenny, for example, playing um, uh, Freight Officer Archibald Ives, the mole, uh, you know, he is a funny guy. He's just a funny guy. Yeah. And they play him like a funny guy. And then he is shot scaling the fence, and things go from funny to not funny really, really fast. And, right. and it ends up being that is one of the, the the real gifts again of the pacing is that it 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 takes you from these these fantastic highs to the deepest lows uh, you know really fast. Yep. Uh, so Sturgis, we haven't talked about another Sturgis film, have we? This is our this first. This is our first. We'll be talking about Magnificent Seven later in the year. Right. 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 Uh, word is he's a very precise director. He's he, according to James Coburn, he says that he he gives actors great freedom to do what they need to do uh, to deliver their roles. He storyboards everything uh, and and yet and gives very precise direction when he needs to. But otherwise, he's a great director of actors. And I found myself laughing out loud at some of the the compliments offered this guy after finishing our Fritz Lang series. <laughs> Right. He's definitely somebody who uh, people seem to like quite a bit. He seems just very honest, very wholehearted, uh, very giving. I mean, very passionate about what he's trying to do and definitely, right. you know, a director who has a vision and is pushing to to achieve that vision. But at the same time, he is uh, just very giving and kind of open with things. That's kind of the impression that I got of him. And I think that when you watch films that he's done, I mean, I read something that says he's developed a reputation for elevated character-based drama within the confines of genre filmmaking. And I definitely see that here. I mean, it's a long film, so you have a lot of time to spend with these characters. Uh, But there are a lot of characters, yet I still feel I have a lot of time with each of them to really get a good uh, sense of who they are and how they fit into this world and how they feel about this world. I haven't seen very many... John Sturge's films. Out of his 45 credits, I'm looking at four or five of them, and it's it's uh, it, it's hurting my feelings. Do you feel like you're something of a student of John uh, Sturge's? No, I'm kind of in your camp on that. I think, uh, I mean, he directed probably 20 films or so before he got to Bad Day at Black Rock, which is the first film of his that I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's uh, Magnificent Seven, Great Escape. Gunfight at OK Corral. I didn't see that. that and then I think Joe Kidd, so... Uh, yeah. Not much. Not yeah, much. that's it. Uh, and the original, or uh, I'm sure it's not original. I'm not sure it's the, the first one, but it was the Spencer Tracy uh, Old Man in the Sea in 58. I think I had to watch that in school, in high school. So yeah, so n- not not many. But, but still, I do get this sense of his, um, uh, uh, th- when I watch his films, they feel, uh, they, they, they come off with just an air of strength. Right, they feel like a a great stone building. Like there's nothing in here that feels like uh, that. Uh, I feel like I'm my my sense of synesthesia is kind of, <laughs> kind of coming out. Like when I watch a John Sturges film, I feel like I'm in a great stone building. Uh, but it just feels like I am in very good hands as an audience member. 
I agree. I, th- I feel like he knows how to kind of take care of you as he's telling his story. Right, exactly. Um, and, and so that leads us into our new uh, segment, First Shot, Last Shot. What do you think? The first shot of this one uh, is our uh, German fields, the idyllic troop carriers uh, moving down the road. Now, of course, this is during the credits where it's really establishing our landscape. Does that count for you as first shot in this case, as the credits are rolling over landscape? It still counts. Okay. Uh, you know, it's. Um, I, I think that they, you know, they're showing that to us very purposefully as the film kicks off. So, yeah, I, I still think it counts. Um, I think what's interesting about the first shot and last shot here is it's really all about kind of the scope of how really kind of, I guess you could say almost how these soldiers are fitting into this scope of the war, right? You start off with the Germans, everything is like in order, the Germans have them captured, and they're they're taking them to the new Stalag Luft three, which has just been uh, uh, redesigned, I I can't remember quite, it wasn't rebuilt, but it was kind of repurposed for these particular soldiers to all be there. And so everything is in order. You've got the the vehicles all going down the line. It's just all clean, crisp, clear. Everything is nice and, and orderly. The Germans are clearly in charge. You get to that last shot, and it's uh, that fantastic shot of Hilt as he's uh, brought back into the cooler, and he he you, the soldier shuts the door on him, locks him in, and instantly you hear him starting to play with his baseball again, and you hear it bouncing off the wall. Uh, and then the guard walks down the hall. You've got the great music playing in both cases, and this is a, a great way to end the film, saying, you know what? These soldiers are not going to quit. They are uh, dedicated. They are going to do what they can to keep fighting. In a way, the Germans may have them in prison, but the Germans are really not the ones who are in control. They're not going to break this, the fighting spirit here. Yeah, and I think that's a that is is certainly one way to look at it. And I absolutely see that. The other one is the other way I look at it is just through the use of space. And I think that's a another. Um, it, it, it's a fascinating kind of linear relationship for me, where we open on the the most beautiful um, scenery of Germany that we can. Right? I mean, it is it is rolling hills. It is you know, it's it's uh, the von Trapp family might as well be there. I mean, it's just. It is just gorgeous, and through each shot, as this as these trucks are winding their way across farmland, um, and and the credits come to an end, we then come to this. Our space compresses, and now we're in the camp, and the camp is no longer beautiful. The woods are all around, but the camp is dry, and it it it's just dirty and cold and. Every space that we move through in the film gets narrower and narrower and narrower from the opening shots in the field to the camp to inside the barracks to inside the rooms to inside the tunnel. And the last shot of the film is inside the cooler. And and I think for me, it's like the it's like the head of an arrow and it comes down to a fine point. And I, I think that's a really interesting use of space over the course of the film that I had not seen before we started talking for shot last shot. That's I, it's a, it's a really interesting opportunity to look at the these different shots and you can see so many different things yeah. in so many different ways. So I absolutely think that's all uh, incredibly valid and really interesting ways to look at it as well. It it really opens the opens the question to me like uh, just the the larger question of the war. Look what we've had to do to our country as a result of this war. We've had to turn this beautiful land into a prison. We've yeah. had to, and and on both sides, right? I mean, we've, and, and we'll talk about the cast. Some of the cast experiences are fascinating when you think about that this, Germany is not alone <laughs> here. You know, we had to do this all over the world. And and this is a, a vis, visual, physical manifestation of, of the hardships of war. I think it's just, it, it ends up being really nice. Uh, so let's run into the cast, shall we? We've talked a little bit about Mr. McQueen. Yeah, and we've talked about him on the show a number of times. Yep. Um, the Blob, Bullet. Uh, he's an actor that we certainly uh, enjoy quite a bit. He's a really interesting actor. This was um, coming at a time in his career where he was a known a known actor. People knew who he was. They liked who he was. He wasn't quite a lead yet. I mean, he was one of those guys that would appear in things like Magnificent Seven, and uh, you know these other films that people liked, um, but they you you couldn't necessarily call them a Steve McQueen vehicle. And then this movie came along, and this is really the movie, even though it still is a by really I mean it's a it's an ensemble piece, 
but he is the one who kind of came out of it as the as the person that everybody remembered and a lot of that i think is because because he has that uh, fantastic you know the spirit that just he'll always keep fighting and always keep uh trying to escape um plus he's got the fantastic motorbike jump he does and and those motorcycle stunts are fantastic he does he does his own uh stunt driving uh throughout the entire film with the exception of the last jump which was done by a, a friend of his and and uh, professional writer Bud Eakins. Uh, but he does, not only does he do all of his own stunt driving when he is playing Captain Virgil Hiltz, he also would then change clothes and put on German outfits, uh, German officers, obscuring his face, and do the entire scene again uh, as the Germans who are supposed to be chasing him because none of the German stunt, or junt, stunt writers that they had hired for the film could actually keep up with him on a bike. So he so had to funny. keep up with himself. I think that's fantastic. I think it's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, according to Burnett, uh, writer Burnett, uh, he says, McQ- McQueen was an impossible bastard. He drove you crazy. Uh, you know, where it is he? He had rented a chateau in, uh, in the nearby town for he and his family and would be chauffeured in to the set every day. Um, ended up getting very frustrated at the 30-minute break where he was in the cooler in the film and and wasn't in the movie at all, you know, because he was... He was in the cooler, so it's it, you know they had, they hired additional an additional writer to come on and make changes and try to try to make him even more of a star, including all of this motorcycle stuff, which again one of those compromises that were not uh, that was not in the the original story. There was no grand motorcycle escape that was manufactured specifically for Steve McQueen. So. And do you know? Did you hear why he was driven to set? <laughs> why? Because he originally um, wasn't. He, he had his car and he would race. He would drive because uh, he was a, you know, he was a race car driver. He knew what he was doing. But he would drive uh, at ridiculous speeds. Um, <laughs> Across the German countryside. He, uh, and they were always like giving him tickets and all this stuff. And, and uh, he got into a really bad car wreck once. Um, he came over a hill or something, and there were some tractors in the road, and he swerved off and and went through some trees or something, and and crashed it into a tree, and I think he ruined his car, and and I think that the, at that point they uh, the German police uh, took his license away, and <laughs> let him drive <laughs> anymore. That's a good story. Oh, yes. Well, you know, one of the things I do want to talk about as we talk about each of these these guys is is their experience in the war, uh, because some of them have more interesting experiences than others. In this case, McQueen, uh, he was in the Marines in World War II. And, uh, you know, it, it, what I read on him is he, he was essentially a hero. He saved some of his uh, it was immediately after World War II that he saved his uh, some of his uh, mates uh, in an Arctic exercise. He pulled the Marines from a tank before it broke through the ice into the sea. See, there you go. Arctic exercise. That's a that's a good thing. You want to be that guy. It wasn't. It wasn't like uh, you know they were. But they weren't the being fired upon. Right. <laughs> yes, it was, it was a tank that, that you have to go take, take a few steps back and just think. How did they get the tank into the sea? <laughs> right. That it would that he had stopped them then. That would have right. been grand. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, anyway, so he did serve. Uh, so uh, moving on, James yes. Garner. Uh, serves as uh, he, he plays Robert Hendley, the scrounger, and he also was a scrounger in his real life military experience in the Korean War. Yes, he was. Uh, how did uh, it, he's? He was very confident. You know, the, listening to him talk about his experience. You know, um, he's also very. He, he's actually a really humble guy. This James Garner. I just love James Garner. I love I mean, him so much. He's got such a great personality, and uh, just is just so casual and easygoing. And it just kind of it seemed to kind of go along with things, you know, yeah. and, and there's just, uh, I, I don't, I, you know, I realize I really haven't seen that many of uh, the projects that he's been involved with, but I've seen enough to just know that he's got that personality that I, I feel like I could really go and enjoy a lot more of his yeah. films. Um, to hear him talk about this experience, you know, that, that sort of humility comes, really comes through just, just this sense of, you know, I'm. I, I this was just that was kind of the role I felt I fell into. It was easy for me to make build relationships with the people who were holding me in Korea. So I, I feel like I had a, a pretty good handle on what Hendley would be like. And I just, you know, you just believe the guy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So he was I thought he was terrific in this uh, in this film. 
Uh, Richard Attenborough, really, we, we probably should have opened with Richard Attenborough. He plays the uh, the central character uh, squadron leader, Roger Bartlett, as you mentioned already, based on Roger Bushel, the real Big X. He was the guy who was charged with uh, uh, with leading the escape. You know, it's so great seeing him act. I mean, you don't you don't see him act. Um, well, I guess I guess uh, depending on how often you watch Jurassic Park. But you know, I, I don't know. I guess uh, he he acted quite a bit. I just haven't seen much of his acting, and I, I feel like I know him so much more um, from his later life, uh, being a, a director of things like uh, Chaplin. Um, but I know that uh, you know earlier on. I mean, really, it was acting that he was doing. I mean, that's really how he started, and he's just done tons of stuff, like from the '40s all the way. I don't think he actually even directed something until '69. Uh, and then it was pretty sparse here and there. And, uh, you know, I think, um, I don't know, Gandhi, you, l- you look at some of the films he's directed, Shadowlands, um, and and then you look at all the stuff that he acted in. Yeah. You don't have to look at the Miracle on 34th Street remake. You can skip that one. But I think there's plenty <laughs> plenty of other great stuff that he did. I mean, even like Elizabeth, which he did right toward uh, toward the end. Um, I mean, he was just a, a bit part in that, but it was great seeing him there. But yeah, he's just, he has a great presence on screen. I just love seeing him. And, uh, I, you know, I don't think I've seen much of him as an actor other than this. And I feel like I've seen, I think, The Sand Pebbles. Or what else? I, not much, but I mean, I love seeing him. Yeah, I, I do too. It's really touching. I found most of the time uh, watching this film, I, I found myself just, you know, taking pictures of him on my phone and then drawing a white beard on his face. He's so young. Yes, he is. He's ridiculously young, but he was fantastic. And you know, this part was originally supposed to be played by Richard Harris, who backed out after reading some script changes from an early draft and said that his role had been minimized too far. And so uh, that was was the luckiest uh, turndown right there, because I think Richard Attenborough was terrific for the part. He's just great. And he's um, he's the older brother of David Attenborough, who does all those fantastic uh, BBC documentaries that I Absolutely. love watching so much. Absolutely. Uh, he, d- he also served in the Royal Air Force, uh, Richard Attenborough did. Um, uh, as far as I could find, he was not uh, shot down or anything like that, but he did serve, so. Yes, he was. As uh, and Yeah, I mean, he, he put in his time. He certainly yeah. did. James Donald uh, plays Group Captain Ramsey. He is the senior British officer on staff. Yeah, he he worked fine. I think that, um, you know, at the end of the film, I think he does so well, that kind of stiff upper lip that uh, the Brits are so well known for as uh, he's given the news of everybody's dead and or like 50 of them were were shot in the in capturing them. uh, And they're all dead, like pretty much telling you they were assassinated. It was not just, you know, escape attempts and they were trying to catch them. Um, I haven't seen him in, in, in anything else that he's done except for Bridge on the River Kwai, which he's in. And he's got that, you know, the I think he's the one who has the very last line, you know, the it's madness or whatever. Uh, you haven't seen um, um, Big Sleep, Robert Mitchum? I guess I just uh, totally didn't remember him in that. There you go. That's a, yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Charles Bronson, uh, also an interesting role in here. We've mentioned him before as Tunnel King. He was, uh, he... I thought he was great. He was surprisingly great in this film. Michael talks about kind of, you know, how different characters affect you different time or like kind of each time you watch the film. And I would think, you know, the first time I watched this, I would definitely say Stephen Queen was the one that I stuck with. This time it was Charles Bronson's character that really stuck with me. The whole bit of uh, kind of that claustrophobia that he gets after just being in the tunnel so much after spending all the time digging and digging and digging. Um, I just really connected with that and just kind of the struggle that he has and, and kind of the frustration people have. It's like, well, we want to help you get out of here, but, you know, you got to stop blocking the tunnel and yeah. all that. I just, I, I, I don't know. I found his character really fascinating and I enjoyed what he brought to the table here. Do you, were you surprised by the mechanics of the tunnels when you first saw this? Like with the the rail, the the wooden rail lines and the... Yeah, the, uh, it's I mean, serious. It's really like, sophisticated. The it, air, it, the air pump... Yeah, it really blows you away as to kind of the scope that these guys, um, you know, took to actually build these tunnels that were really, really structurally designed properly to actually succeed on these missions. I mean, it really blows you away. The amount of wood that they pull from the bunks and from the slats and just everywhere. I mean, it really, it's a pretty astounding 
um, process. Just to, I mean, to have 300 some feet of tunnel and all of it shored up so well with these tracks and uh, it, yeah, it's it's nuts. And the fact that they were developing three of them at the yeah. same time. Uh, it's just amazing. And the amount of wood that they had to to somehow steal from their beds, from their bed frames, from the frame of the of the bunkers, and shuttle it down into these tunnels to to shore up the walls and the roof so it doesn't collapse so much. I mean, it, it's just a stunning engineering undertaking. Well, and then what they don't depict in the film at all is the fact that, you know, I mean, this is kind of going on over the course of a couple of years. There's snow on the ground half right. the time. They can't dump the dirt during the snowy season. So they had to figure out other places to dump the dirt. And it sounds like they were using, I guess they had a little theater that they had built. And so they were hiding the dirt like inside the seats of the theater. And I just, it's stunning the the, the um, tricks that they came up with to kind of get rid of this stuff. Right. You get that one. You get that one hint, the quick hint, where they're actually hiding it up in the rafters. They're dumping it up in the <laughs> and the ceiling above. starts yeah. to bow. <laughs> it, yeah, terrific. Um, the uh, Donald Pleasance uh, was in the film. Now this is this was an interesting one. He did. He played uh, Colin Blythe, the forger, who ends up going uh, nearly blind. Donald Pleasance, of course, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, in this film. Most interesting to me, he served also in WW2 as a pilot. He was shot down over France, captured, and spent a year in Stalag Luft 21. Uh, So he was quite literally a guy who could very well have been in the real Great Escape. Um, You know, obviously a different... um, Stalag camp, but uh, that he served there for a year. It was fantastic. And he says, you know, of his note, he says that he tried to make suggestions based on that experience. And he says, they didn't go down well with Sturgis and the American crew, who believed all people who were in a prison camp, especially if you were American, were enormously brave. (laughs) I can, I mean, you know, given the cast, I can kind of understand that perspective, (laughs) how they might have that perspective. It's a shame. And that really underscores why I think this could be remade as something really fantastic, too. And a little bit more balanced. So I thought that was funny. funny. Uh, James Coburn. uh, He was probably a, you know, I like watching James Coburn. He's a charismatic guy. Not a great Aussie. He, you know, I think um, Quentin Tarantino pulled from uh, Coburn's Australian accent uh, when he was getting ready to do his in Django Unchained. Yeah. Uh, James Coburn is just not meant to play in Australian. It really was terrible. Absolutely terrible. But, you know, I could see why he brought in Coburn and Bronson and McQueen because, you know, Sturgis just used all these guys in Magnificent Seven. They did a great job. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, despite the terrible Australian accent, Coburn brings the right attitude to the table to play this kind of laid back character. And I love his bit. I love his escape. I love just kind of the casual biking around, uh, kind of getting helped by the French resistance and making it to Spain. I mean, I, I love everything about it except for his Australianness. This uh, also came out the same year of one of my favorite films, Charade, which was uh, great that. Um, that uh, he is in that as one of the antagonists. Just a fantastic, fantastic film. Just so you can hear his accent as it is meant to be. Yes, yeah, exactly. Anything. And then the very next year, he was in The Americanization of Emily with James Garner. Another great film. He's actually in um, the Flint series, which I just absolutely have a blast watching. Our Man Flint and In Like Flint. Great little mm-hmm. uh, kind of James Bond spoofs. Yeah. Hans Mesmer played Oberst von Luger, the commandant of the camp. Yes. Uh, and he is one of those as who served in World War II, German soldier, and he was captured as a POW and held in Russia, and uh, he escaped and had to walk hundreds of miles to the border of Germany uh, to be rescued. So there, this is the first of the of the German actors in this movie playing parts that they served as Germans in that very war. That twisted my head around a little bit. I read that uh, the Germans who performed in this were actually quite excited to play the Germans in this film. I I don't know if it was just kind of a guilt complex that they had about what had gone on or what. But um, yeah, I mean, he had served on the Eastern Front of World War II. So it's interesting that he was kind of in the army we were fighting. Till Kiwi as Frick, the German uh, who was a German um, soldier. Uh, he actually also served as a German paratrooper in World War II. He was captured. He was held in a POW camp 
And I have two sources on this, one that says adamantly it was in Colorado, one adamantly that it was in Arizona, uh, but that he escaped with forged papers uniform in uniform by train to St. Louis, where he was caught. Um, he was the cast member on uh, that had actually done the most of the things that they were portraying on screen. He tried to escape himself 17 times, if not more. Do you have any other characters uh, that you wanted, any actors that you want to talk about that we've missed? Uh, I, th- obviously, there are a boatload of people we haven't talked about, but those were the ones that really stood out that, that I wanted to talk about. The only other ones that I was going to say anything about was David McCallum. Dispersal. Yeah, he kind of comes up with that. And he's got that great little moment at the uh, at the train station there where he uh, dies protecting Big X's identity. Oh, that's which right. Which is a yeah. fantastic moment. But uh, do you recognize him at all from Man from Uncle? If the I had sh- ever seen the show. <laughs> yeah, the show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's uh, Kuryakin. He's the oh, Russian. Oh, of course. Yeah, he is the Russian lead. Okay. Yeah, there he is. So yeah, all 105 episodes he was in them. Not to mention, not to mention the uh, the return of the Man from Uncle, 15 years later affair. So I mean, yeah, he was he was definitely deep in that. I mean, he, gosh, yeah, 140 credits. He was in. Uh, I think he is still in NCIS. You know, he's mm-hmm. 305 episodes of NCIS. Uh, so um, yeah, he's a guy who has been. Just all around doing little bits of everything. I didn't make that connection. He's the doctor, right? I don't know. I've never seen NCIS. So yeah, um, so I wanted to mention him. And then, of course, Judd Taylor, who I kind of already mentioned. I just wanted to say again, you know, he he played Goff, uh, one of the other three Americans. And he is the one who um, did direct the uh, that TV sequel. The Great Escape 2. Right, Great Escape 2, The Untold Story. Still digging. <laughs> Still. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about getting the thing uh, made. This was a tough one to get off the ground for Sturgis. It was a, a, a story of escape. I mean, there had, from you know, kind of what I had read, there hadn't been a lot of escape films yet. I mean, there was The Bridge in the River Kwai um, and Stalag 17, which both had some of their... Some of the elements, uh, certainly prison camp sort of stories, but this whole idea of escape, um, it just wasn't uh, big. And the fact that 50 of these guys get killed at the end of it, it just seemed like a real downer and people were like, I don't want to do that. So finally, the Mirish company uh, said that they would do it for John Sturgis. These guys um, had, uh, I think it was um, Walter Mirish. And I, why, did I, why did I feel like it was brothers? Yeah, his brothers. Yeah, they Marvin were brothers. Harold. Yeah. Yeah, they had a deal, uh, a distribution deal with United Artists, a 12-picture deal that they put together back in the late 50s. They kind of decided, hey, well, let's get the funding. We'll give the funding to you guys to get this movie made. They really believed in it and uh, and pushed it forward. Um, so, it, But it took, like, from the time the book came out in the 50s through all the way into the early 60s for, for uh, John Sturgis to actually get this deal made. And, of course, like you said, in that time, there were 11 scripts written, and so it was very confusing once they actually got this whole thing off the ground. Mirish Company ends up having a lot of great films and properties under their their rather short-lived uh, existence. Oh, yes, they do. They, I mean, um, seriously. Yeah, West Side Story, Magnificent Seven, The Apartment, Some Like It Hot, The Pink Panther series, The Heat Thomas the Crown Affair. In the, yeah, Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah, yeah it's uh, they, they did some pretty solid stuff, these guys. Grand, grand luck. Uh, one of the one of the notes that that came out of, of my research, which I thought was really uh, amusing, uh, this came from Un- United Artists, and I'm not sure what to make of it. In a film about all men in a prison camp for men, uh, that is run by German men, where the story is centrally about men digging holes. Uh, the note says, early on in the production, Sturgis began receiving memos from distributor United Artist requesting female roles in the picture. One even suggested having the dying Ashley Pitt, played by David McCallum in the film, cradled in the lap of a beautiful girl in a low-cut blouse. The studio wanted to cast this bit by having a Miss Prison Camp contest in Munich, and Sturgis luckily would have none of it. I don't even know what to make of that, but wow. Miss Prison Camp, Andy. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Right? That is so wrong. That's how you drive a movie into the ground and nobody would ever remember it. That's right. That's right. Oy, oy. Cinematography, uh, Daniel Fapp and Walter Rimmel. Well, Fapp was the uh, the cinematographer on this and Walter Rimmel was the uh, the camera 
uh, first second camera operator on this one, mm-hmm. uh, who helped him out, and he was a. Um, uh, I, I, from what I read about uh, about Rimmel, is that um, he really became kind of a specialist in filming snow scenes, and so he ended up becoming a key guy to help out with On Her Majesty's Secret Service um, a few years after this. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I think he's. Uh, I think that um, mostly, I think that the credit for the film itself probably goes to Fap. Although in a long film like this, I, I imagine that Rimmel was out running around. Uh, when you're shooting two cameras, you got to get a lot of stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. But Fap, I mean, he had won uh, an Oscar for Best Side, West Side Story just um, just a few uh, years before this, 1961. Interestingly, um, what I thought was funny is that um, Time Magazine actually, in their review for this film in 1963, uh, they actually said, the use of color photography is unnecessary and jarring, but little <laughs> else is wrong with this film. <laughs> I think that goes to show kind of the mentality of the time and how people were just kind of, you know, color was seen as kind of something special still. Right, right. And I'm not he- used to hearing the actors speak. <laughs> Where are the interstitial title cards? <laughs> Uh, so that's pretty funny. funny. He's but, he has a, a number of very uh, popular films of the time under his uh, credits list. Again, we mentioned West Side Story. You mentioned Our Man Flint, uh, Unsinkable Molly Brown, um, uh, One Two Three, One Two Three, Lil Abner. Um, well, then, and then he also does Ice Station Zebra with uh, with Sturgis. Uh, yes, in sixty eight. Right, right. Sweet November. Well, and I think he captures the look well for this film I, you know i mean i guess you know in a film like this what they they did is you know, they would film outside when it wasn't cloudy when the clouds would come um they would all go inside and they would film so they always had uh, backups ready to go at any given time he he managed to keep the look really consistent and and uh strong across the whole uh the whole thing and i think the stuff that he does um uh, what I think it just works so well is all the stuff in the tunnels, finding the right way to light those tunnels. So it really does feel like you're watching these things that are kind of lit by either candles or or those, those little light strings when they finally put those down there. And I think he does a great job doing that. Oh, I do too. I, I've been thinking about going back between the, the production design and, and Fernando Carrera designing the tunnels and the compound um, and, and how they shot these things. Because really, I mean, they, they had to end up building a large section of tunnel to make this work because there are shots where they're 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 you know lateral like dolly shots right where they're moving sideways along that you know the cart as these their bodies are on it but they move along for a long period um, and they have shots where they're looking down the tunnel where all the sides are are in and so you know um, I'm I found myself really thinking, gosh, how much of a breakaway wall do they have? How did they actually do it? Well, what I, I think was so interesting is the design of this whole camp. They actually brought in a former Canadian POW who is actually part of The Great Escape. He came in as the technical advisor on the on the film, Wally Floody. Um, hugely important in getting everything to really look and feel right. And they would have him, like basically he was this technical advisor and they said it was almost like he, like you would check him out, like different departments would say, oh, okay, can I check out Wally for a little while and come have him look at the at the costumes or let's have him look at the tunnels. And he would get into the tunnels and he'd go, no, you know what, it's, it's I, I remember my shoulders um, were touching both sides it you know it's a little too wide here and and like he would go around and really just kind of making sure that everything was right and this was something where I mean, Sturgis really, really wanted to make sure everything was right for this film. Um, he and his team um, were doing everything they could to really make it feel like, uh, you know, as accurate as possible, given the fact that it was all being compressed and and everything. But um, I think that by doing that, they they did find a way to really just put you into it so much more. You know, the fact that this guy was saying, no, 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 let's make it more narrow. No, let's raise this up a little bit. I think that's uh, incredibly important. Well, it was just beautifully captured um, uh, on film by Fap. Uh, well, I already sort of led into production design. Um, overall, it is just it ends up being really believable 
um, setting. They were actually going to originally um, shoot this um, in the in the mountains just outside of Palm Springs because they're like, oh, you know, we can shoot there and we can put up all of the uh, the talent uh, in Palm Springs, and then everybody can just kind of drive up and and we'll just film up there. And they scouted, and their the trees did not look anything. Uh, right, but they're like, yeah, you know, we can make it work. We can put a thing in, and it'll it'll pass. And they were totally all set to do this. And um, I think what happened was they ended up getting into an argument with the Screen Extras Guild because the uh, the Extras Guild would not let them get the numbers of extras that they needed to come on that weren't union. And these guys were like, there's no way we're going to be able to afford paying, you know, hundreds of extras every day to come out and play prisoners um, if they're all union. It's just not going to work. And so um, that's what actually drove um, uh, Sturgis and his team to go, you know what, let's just go look at Germany and see uh, at least what it looks like. Maybe we can find a different area. And they went and scouted Germany and they're like, you know what, there, you can't do this anywhere except Germany because it it just has such a look. And so they, they made that decision. And I think that hugely helped the production design. You know, they found this stretch of forest in the Bavarian forest where they chopped down all the trees and built the thing. And they, they came up with a deal where it's like two for one, where for every tree they would cut down, they would they would replant two trees in the area. And so, and it was a kind of a tree farm area anyway. So, so they, they, built this whole uh, compound right there based on on Fleddy's uh, designs. And I think what uh, Fernando brought to the table here just, I mean, it feels like they shot this at an actual POW camp. It really does. And that was my favorite quote. I think it was Fab talking to Fernando. He says, he answers the question. So, okay, what does Germany look like? Does it look like what we need it to look like? He says, guess what Germany looks like? It looks like Germany. It is criminal if we do not shoot on location, which I thought was a really great moment. Totally funny. Uh, it is, uh, it is beautiful. And, um, uh, you know, all of the locations are right around there. You know, you, you mentioned the forest, it's the, the Perlocker Forest. Um, the German town is, is now Poland, uh, Zagen, Poland. Uh, they right. changed the name to Neustadt for filming. Uh, and then the uh, Fusen Railway Station and the St. Nicholas Church is in there. And uh, so it was, uh, it was all, it's all local. Which is kind of funny for a 1963 film. You expect it to be a studio film, like a yeah, a back right, exactly. Film. Yeah. And and they filmed at the Bavaria Film Studio in Munich, and it was a um, I think at the time the German film industry was really trying to kind of figure out how they could get themselves back on track. And after I mean it had been a, a, you know a while after the war ended, but still. Nobody wanted to go film there, and their mm-hmm. industry hadn't taken off again. And so uh, this really kind of was a, a you know good help for them. While we're talking about the locations, I just wanted to, uh, you know, a few little tidbits of inf- interesting info I learned about Stalag Luft 3. This was just one of two famous escapes from here, which I didn't realize. The other one, what they did is they actually, these guys conjured up basically what they said it was like a modern Trojan horse. They built one of those gymnastic vaulting horses. Um, they built it out of mostly plywood from Red Cross parcels. Um, and they built this designed to actually hide men, tools, and containers of soil inside. And what they would do is every day they would carry it out to the same spot by the perimeter of the fence. And while prisoners were doing gymnastics exercises on the, the pommel horse, um, the people inside this thing were opening up the bottom and digging down underneath. And then at the end of each day, they put a wooden board over the tunnel, cover it with dirt, and then their team would carry them back <laughs> into the uh, it, back inside. And uh, the whole thing was this this rig. And these three British prisoners, I, I guess they came up with this whole thing, and they actually escaped. It was successful, and they made it back to uh, Britain eventually. And they actually made a movie about this in 1950 called... The Wooden Horse, and there's also a book written about this one. So a really interesting little thing. I had no idea there was another famous escape from this prison. That's fantastic. I want to watch that movie immediately. Um, There were the three tunnels, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Uh, Tom was actually discovered in September 1943, and I didn't realize this, but this was the 98th tunnel that the German officers had discovered (laughs) that these guys had been digging. Just goes to show how um, these soldiers really were doing everything they could to try to get out. Not just this great big tunnel that uh, and the great escape, 
But, I mean, it really, it was a perpetual thing that was going on. It, you wonder how the thing at 98 Tunnels, how the thing's still even above ground. Like, it's, it, <laughs> right. you would start to expect the entire camp to start to sink. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then the uh, um, eventually this whole camp actually grew to about 60 acres in size. It housed about 2,500 Royal Air Force officers, about 7,500 U.S. Army forces, and about 900 officers from other allied air forces for a total of 10,949 inmates, including some supporting officers. So that's just to give you a sense as to how many people were here. I mean, it was a lot of people um, being uh, held as POWs at this camp. Well, let's uh, let's let's talk about uh, editing a little bit. Uh, one of the things that we we've, we've noted is just that the the story itself is already compressed. How do you find Ferris Webster does um, in in terms of putting the the film together and compressing that time even more? I, I think he does a good job of taking the bits and pieces and just finding the right way to um, to edit things together to move things along. Um, you don't ever feel like you have to linger on anything too long. You know, you feel like you get the information and then you're moving on already. And I think that's just a, a probably something he learned uh, working on so many. I mean, he did 15 films for Sturgis. And, you know, Sturgis, he has these, these uh, big films. So you can get a sense that Webster probably learned how to kind of do that uh, sort of pacing working with Sturgis. He actually worked with uh, Frankenheimer on on his entire, entire Paranoia trilogy, Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May, and Seconds. And in fact, Webster was nominated for an Oscar um, three times, once for this, and then also for The Blackboard Jungle and Manchurian Candidate. Uh, and of course, the music, Elmer Bernstein, um, it's, it is a, a legendary score. Uh, the the march is fantastic. Unfortunately, uh, all I hear is stripes. Really, that's so disappointing. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's Again, so because that funny. march now it's that tone is associated for me with a comedy, and that makes this movie funny where it shouldn't be. Well, I mean, he did stripes, and I mean, he did a lot of those um, those early uh, comedies for Landis and people um, around that period of time, which is probably why it sounds like Stripes, or Stripes sounds like this, you know? Well, it is It is an homage. I mean, it really is, in terms of a military comedy, it's designed to do that, I think, by you know, by design. Talking about films that we've discussed that do homages, I mean, as terrible as the film was, but Monuments Men also d- did a nice homage with the score uh, for this film. And, uh, you know, Desplat's score in that film was uh, probably one of the stronger things about that movie. Um, and it had that nice kind of homage to the kind of the whistling feel of the march in this film. Um, Bernstein's score is just fantastic in this film. I mean, really, from top to bottom, I just absolutely love it. Um, I saw, you know, the the symphony here in town did an Elmer Bernstein concert a few months back, and they played the march to this. And it's just so fantastic to hear it live. Brilliant. Just oh, yeah. brilliant. And he's just, I mean, he's just so prolific. I mean, everything he's done, so many different genres, feels. I mean, I just love what Bernstein does. Uh, how to do an awards season? Weirdly, and I don't know if it's just because this was, uh, you know, one of those films that's seen as an ensemble thing. People are like, well, you know, I don't want to make it. Like, nobody wanted to be involved with it. It was so weird. The only Oscar it was nominated for was Best Film Editing for Fer- Ferris Webster, um, as we already said. Um, it's just strange that uh, this was not something like this is the sort of thing that you now look at and go, oh, that that had to be nominated for Best Picture. Nope. Uh, the five nominees for Best Picture were Tom Jones, America, America, Cleopatra, How the West Was Won, and Lilies of the Field. Oh, my God. I, yeah, Tom Jones is the only one I've seen. It's a terrible movie. And that's what won Best Picture, Tom Jones. Uh, it's kind of that uh, 18th century comedy, and I just don't remember much about it. Um, it's one that I feel like I need to go back and watch again because people uh, rail on it so much as you know one of those fil- films that definitely didn't deserve to win best picture. Um, But in context of having uh, seen Great Escape and that, I would say, yeah, Great Escape should have uh, probably won over Tom Jones. And uh, if nothing else, it should have at least been nominated over some of these other films. So um, I can understand why some of the actors may not have been nominated. I mean, it's a huge cast. It's hard to kind of pinpoint it. But again, to have the only Oscar nomination be editing, um, it's just kind of a shocker now. We've already mentioned the sequel, uh, Great Escape Two. That uh, any other uh, any other items we've neglected here? There, there are only two other things I wanted to bring up. One 
the original poster by uh, Frank McCarthy. I just love that poster. It's just a beautiful image. You know, you've got the the title with the barbed wire kind of cutting across it. And then you've got all the guys just kind of running out. And it's it's not like it's a scene from the film or anything like that. Yeah, it just has that one never of those, happens. Right. It's, it's just a beautiful design. And uh, Frank McCarthy, I mean, he had designed a bunch of fantastic posters like uh, Ten Commandments, The Train, The Dirty Dozen, Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, he also worked with Robert McGinnis on Thunderball, You Only Live Twice, and on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Just fantastic, fantastic poster design. Uh, and what is this Spirit of 76 thing? Spirit of 76. This is one of those weird things that, for the life of me, I was just driven crazy by this trio of like the drum fife uh, thing. It's like uh, that they, that the uh, three Americans kind of do when they're playing Yankee Doodle Dandy as they're walking, right? Sure, yeah, right. I was like, because I've seen it in, like Bugs Bunny. You know, it's always like the the guy. Uh, one of them has a limp, and it's just like this thing. It's just like, what is this from? This you know weird little thing. Um, and it's actually a painting called "The Spirit of Seventy Six by Archibald Willard. That um, uh, I'm trying to figure out when he painted it. Uh, around 1875, they say. Um, but it's it's his most famous work. It was actually previously known as Yankee Doodle, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a a painting that it is it's of a, a three men uh, kind of walking along, and it's kind of this um, the whole idea of the drum line um, that during like the Revolutionary War and the Civil War of these Americans, like the 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 drummer boys who would kind of even if they were wounded would be kind of leading the troops. Sure. And it's just, it was one of those images that that popped up here. And I'm like, I have to figure out where that's from. Because it's just, I, I see it so much in like cartoons and it's always referenced in things. Um, and sure enough, that's what it is. It's this famous painting, Spirit of 76 by Archibald Willard. Well, I'm proud of you, Andy. You just learned us some stuff. I did. About art. I love it. <laughs> well, how did it do? Please, please tell me you have something about this film. Yeah, I definitely have more for this film than I had <laughs> than for, the Fritz Langs for Fritz Lang. He was a little tricky. Uh, this film did open July fourth, nineteen sixty three. Um, so another uh, July fourth movie, uh, just like Terminator Two, which we just talked about recently. Um, this film cost four million dollars to make in uh, sixty three dollars, which is today about thirty point five million. So. For a surprising what ends up being a three-hour movie in a big production in Germany, that seems to be a pretty great budget. Yeah, it seems like they did a good job with the money they had. <laughs> yeah. um, this film ended up making here in the States about $11.7 million, and I don't have any international figures for it, so I don't know what it did overseas. But all told, this film ended up making an adjusted profit per finished minute of about three hundred fifty thousand dollars. So it did it did well for itself, especially considering its length. Uh, yeah, it really sounds like it. It, it was um, what didn't it end up being one of the more uh, profitable films of the year? This film did. Uh, it was, I think, number three on the list of films from nineteen sixty three as far as at the box office. So it definitely um, made some decent money. Uh, the highest grossing film, though, of nineteen sixty three, not was, Tom of Jones, course, not Tom Jones, not it's Tom. It's not Tom Jones. Luckily. It is. It's a mad, 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 mad world. Oh, what did you think of that? It's fun. Yeah, you know, I too long. I, it's it's just one of those. Yeah, it's a fun, you know, romp. Though I guess it's just one of those sorts of things. Well, I think with all of that said, I think we should rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com. You just search for the Great Escape and stop. It's not the Great Escape Two. It's not this Trojan horse cockamamie. It's just the Great Escape. It's McQueen, and we're gonna rank it filmo a filmo right here. Great Escape versus... For a stop, The Great Escape, or it's not the Yo Brother block, Pete. It's the Long Kiss Goodnight block. Great Escape or Long Kiss Goodnight? Great Escape. You know, I would actually watch Long Kiss Goodnight first because I do have so much fun watching that. But yeah, Great Escape is a better film. Yep. Whew. The Great Escape or Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I'm going to say Great Escape. Oh, I'm going to say Eternal Sunshine. Are you ready? I am. One, One two, two, three... three. Rock. Scissors. Ooh, you crushed me. I crush you. All right, Great Escape takes it. Great Escape or the French Connection. I'm Great French Escape. Connection. Really? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, I'll give you French Connection. <laughs> I, it's a principled <laughs> loss. I said what? I got it off my chest. There I'm you go, okay. right. The Great Escape or Moneyball. Moneyball. 
I'm tempted to go Great Escape. Ooh, weird. Really not in alignment tonight. No. How I know. tempted are you? Come on. I'll give you Moneyball. Okay. And then for me, I got it out there. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> the Great Escape or Shaun of the Dead? It's Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead. The Great Escape or Out of the Past? I'm going to say Out of the Past. Really? Oh, yeah. I just, that's, you know, noir. It's, you know, that's my thing. I'm big. No, I mean, I, I'm, I get that. (laughs) Okay. I'll give it to you. It's fine. Okay. The Great Escape or Caddyshack. Great Escape. Definitely Great Escape. Hands down. (laughs) All right. The Great Escape or The Silent Partner. Oh. That's a good one. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking I'm going to go Great Escape uh, because I, 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 maybe it's just going to be hard voting for a film set in a mall. Oh, I don't know. Christopher Plummer and those eyes through the mail Christopher slot. Christopher Plummer in a dress. Pretty malicious, <laughs> but I'm still going to say Great Escape. <laughs> All right. Well, that leaves it at number 59. That feels good. I think that feels great. It, you know, it's a, it's a really, really good film. And uh, man, it's just, it's funny how easy it is to watch in context of like what you see is like a Saving Private Ryan type of World War II film. Yeah. This is really kind of like an easy entry into World War II and just kind of starting to kind of get a sense as to what's going on. Kind of like what Michael said, kind of showing his kids with it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and it made me think back to the when I first saw the film. It was with my own dad, you know. I mean, that's this is like one of those Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of events uh, that was just really fun sitting down and watching this movie with him. It was important to him at the time. And uh, and so it's 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 fun to go back and revisit it. It's important to me now too. Uh, awesome. So what does that do to your flick, your letterbox ranking? Letterbox.com slash the next reel. I'm at four and a half. Me too, Andy. Hey hey, we may I have been uh, fighting on flick chart, but at least we're in agreement here. Truly, and I I gave you the Andy Love half point. <laughs> I even thought about that. I thought I'm gonna I want to do the half point for Andy. That's so nice of you. Do it. Put it down there. Where do we go from here? We've got a little. Uh, we've got a little series ahead of us. Yes, we're doing our vacation challenge. We we each picked our films for each other, and I, I threw at you the uh, the stop motion animation, and you threw at me the uh, end of the world comedy. So we're talking about Paranorman first, and uh, then following that up with Doctor Strangelove. I'm very excited for that. Have you watched either of them yet? I just finished Paranorman last night and very much looking forward to chatting about that again because it is, I, I mean, I liked it the first time, but I was like, this was even better than I remembered. It is so much better than I remembered it too. It's got a lot of life. I'm very excited to talk about that film. Yes. Uh, we do have a trailer rewind coming up. Uh, they're finally, finally doing one of mine, Mr. Nobody. Uh, Steve and JJ are going to be sitting down to uh, to talk about Mr. Nobody. I'm excited to see what they think of that film. That that actually probably could have been in the Mindbender category. Uh, so I'm excited to see how they like that. Uh, so if you want to catch up, that one's on Netflix too. You can jump in and see what you think. Awesome. I got to go to bed. Go to bed? But tonight's the night we make our great escape. Amazon giveth, Andy. As they always do. Dane Dane here on uh, March 24th, 2014. Watch this film on DVD and his title, mm, Crap Film in Which the Americans Distort History. Now, I feel like I sort of opened with this, that I was conflicted about how much I like this film because I do really, really like this film. And yet this, it really, it's distorted, right? Settled. It's mm-hmm. distorted. Oh, yes. He says, this film is an insult to the 50 Allied airmen who were murdered by the Germans on escape from a POW camp, made only to make yet again the Americans look like they were the true brains and heroes of World War II. No American escaped from this camp, says Dane. And he is right. He is right about that. But to call it an insult to the 50 Allied airmen, I mean, I I understand that... You know, it's it's not specifically about the the correct fifty people, but I, I don't. Yeah, know. Yeah, no, I that part maybe is not the the part, but he's right about the fact that no Americans left the camp, and and it it is. Uh, 
the, the Americans were made to look like the brains of the operation, I think, and the, the heroes of, of the thing. Well, actually, that's not entirely true because Richard Attenborough was, in fact, yeah, he's not, kind of, not American, yeah. and he's the brain of the operation. But still, as we said in the beginning, it's heavily biased toward the American perspective, and that's just because of the time, and it's because of who was making the film, and we can't apologize for that. Well, and that's, yeah, and that's how they got funding. I mean, yes. there's, there are, there are, you know, elements Practical you have to look realities. at. Practical realities. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're spending $4 million on something, you know, yeah. it's like somehow you have to guarantee you're going to get some of that money back. Right. Steve McQueen will ride a motorcycle. All right. Who's yours? Well, I've got a one star by Barry Fortier, who um, watched it October 21st on, in 2011 on DVD also. It says, impossible to rate, as it is a very entertaining movie, but it is not based on the book. It is a Hollywood hype of a true story reduced to a pathetic star vehicle for a hot actor of the time on a motorcycle. There was no Cooler King in the book, no motorcycle, and it was largely a Commonwealth, uh, too. Very few Yanks involved in it. A sad and dishonest treatment of an utterly incredible story. If you want an entertaining movie, this is a good one. If you want the true story, buy the book. That's a very balanced perspective, Barry. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think that's true. I mean, it is entertaining. I think the value to a movie like this, and I, I you know, we talked, we touched on it at the beginning when we were doing our interview with Michael, is that a film like this can kind of open the doors for people to start exploring some of the truths of what really happened. And I think that's the value. I mean, not everybody's going to do that. And some people will probably walk away thinking that the Americans saved the day. But I think that for people who are interested in history and that sort of thing, they can find a lot of value from a movie like this, even if it is entertaining. I agree. Well put, sir. And on that, thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. <laughs> you see what, I, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin the Third with the Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wrights series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read.